Uh, good morning and um, welcome and thank you for attending, uh, members of Dr. Noam. Um, for those that may not know me, um, on behalf of Dr. Noam's Israel Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you here and I will be hosting the presentation today. Now, for many of late, the headlines, news, and stories coming out of Israel have been frustrating, disappointing, stunning, and frankly shocking. Notwithstanding the final coalescing of a so-called national unity government, Israel appears to be fractured and fragmented in more directions than there are cabinet members. Yet only three months ago, Israel appeared to be a poster child for a citizenry acknowledging and adhering to government legislation aimed at combating COVID-19. Israel took the lead in pandemic management and the majority implemented and honored a series of draconian measures introduced to slow and protect the country's citizens from the ravages of COVID-19. Over the course of three months, the infection rate was slowed, the medical system continued to function extremely well, and the majority of Israelis accepted the deprivations and isolation for the greater good. Not so today, as Israel finds itself in a desperate fight to curtail the second wave. But my friends, we're not here to wallow in doom and gloom, quite the opposite, in fact. We are here for learning, to be introduced to a movement not only dedicated to, but actively engaged in activities promoting tikkun olam in its most practical and effective manifestations. We are fortunate to have this opportunity to hear about Dror Israel, a pioneering educational movement whose mission is to effect meaningful long-term education and social change in Israel to promote solidarity and social activism, and to promote democracy and equality amongst all its citizens. Think urban kibbutz. But now that's the day job of Dror Israel. What happens when such a mo movement butts up against an unexpected national and worldwide pandemic? So we're gonna find out. Our guest today and representative of Dror Israel is Roe Tao. Erev Tov Roi, and thank you for joining us and presenting thank you to for us. having me. Our pleasure. By way of introduction, Roi Tao founded a soccer program for at youth, at risk youth, as part of Dror Israel, where he works as a developmental director. Roi holds a bachelor's of education in informal education and a teacher certificate from Israel's leading teachers college, Beit Barrel. For the last seven years, Roe has been traveling frequently to North America to his Jewish centers to collaborate with individuals, organizations, and communities around his passion for the Zionist ideal and the future state of Israel. Roe is a big lover of the Israeli kitchen and cooks, I'm told, a mean shakshuka. He's 34 years old, lives in Petah Tikva as part of Dror Israel's educators community. Now, shortly we'll take, uh, we'll have Roe take over but I encourage you to use the chat feature to raise questions that you would like Roe to answer. Kindly keep all submissions in the form of a question, Jeopardy style. It may be possible, I'm not too sure by the end, if we can open up for, for speech, but uh, let's use chat for now. It's probably the most effective way. So once again, thank you all for dialing in and Roe, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you everyone for being here and uh, and uh, listening to this presentation. I would just say that um, it, last October I visited in person Belken Noam. I went, I met with um, with the rabbi and uh, with Joanna. Um, it was a short meeting, and uh, to that I went to this to your community and to your beautiful building that you're facilitated in. And ever since I've kept in touch with Mark and um, also spoke to um, the Israel committee a few months ago, and I'm glad to have uh, this opportunity as well uh, to speak with a larger crowd and share a bit what, uh, what we're doing uh, in general and what we did during the time of COVID, which we're in, in, uh, still in. So as Mark said, um, if you have any questions along the way, just write them in the chat and hopefully at the end we'll have a few minutes that I can answer a few, a few of your questions. Um, I have a, a PowerPoint for you that will lead us to this presentation. I hope you will find it nice. Um, okay. 
So, um, we'll begin. So, as Mark said, I will just say again, my name is Roe. Actually, on Friday, I just celebrated my 34th birthday. Um, and in Droll, what I, my main role is in development, and also I'm a soccer coach, as, as Mark said, working mainly with teenagers uh, at Risk Youth in an informal framework that I founded a few years back. Um, and I will begin my presentation with just giving you a bit of background about what Dwell Israel is, what do we do in normal times, um, and then how we transitioned into uh, what we did during the pandemic. Um, oh, sorry. Let's see my notes. All right. Okay, that's okay. Um, and so I, I'm just sorry. Uh, so what we did in what we do in normal times, and also what we did during the the pandemic, um, and how we transitioned. So let's begin um, a bit about Draw Israel. Um, <clears throat> So Droysville has been around for about more than 20 years, officially declared in 2006. Uh, when we're talking about Draw Israel, we're talking about 1,500 educators, professional educators, um, all of them after the army, um, living in what we call intentional communities or educators, educators communities all across the country. And you will find us mostly uh, in Israel's social and geographical periphery. Uh, and in mixed cities, places like Akko. Um, and on, on the left here, you can, you can see the, the vision for Israel, which is vision of democracy and equality and peace, and where we emphasize education and community. So when you think about well, what we do is education uh, in different ways that I will get into a minute. And where we're trying to have everyone to benefit from those opportunities and try to uh, actualize themselves. And on the, on the bottom, our mission, our mission is to educate and empower young people and those in the social and geographical periphery to actively contribute to their communities and to create a shared society in Israel. I think that the social and geographical periphery and when we're talking about, we can also talk about the neighborhoods in southern Tel Aviv because the, the social geographical periphery of Israel is vast. But we're talking about communities that are struggling, um, that, are, that have lack, lack of resources, that need more education, that need more emphasis. And that is where you will find us, where you will find our programs uh, uh, mostly. So I'll just stop sharing for a second so I can see the notes that I wrote to myself. Right. Okay. So, what what do we do? What what is what is our work? Um, so, as I said, we, we are located in sixteen different communities. You can see in the middle the map of Israel, and on, it's quite small. But um, try to expand it for a second. So on those blue dots, um, and you can see in a number of cities that are in Israel, uh, this is where our, our communities are based. Most of them are urban communities. Um, can you hear me now better? So someone has addressed the, the, the sound. Um, so again, this is 16, 16 educators communities that are spread all over the country. They are intentional communities of people after their army service who um, are part of this organization. All of them are professional educators with degrees like myself from Beth Bell's Teacher College and others, and who do this as a, as a, as a daily work. So I'll just mention a few of our key programs. On the, on the left, up on the left of the screen, you can see schools for youth at risk. 
We have a network of nine high schools all over the country with more than 1,100 students participating in those schools um, with a very progressive pedagogy that we built, which is based around dialogue and project building. Um, we have Jewish Arab programs. You can find them mostly in mixed cities like Akko and Jaffa and Haifa and Jerusalem, but it happens all over the country. Um, and I would say that in our youth movement, which is also down on the left, we have one of the largest youth movements in Israel, which is called Hanor or Vet Valued in Hebrew. In English, it's called the Working and Studying Youth Movement. So in our youth movement, which has more than 90,000 participants, 20,000 of them, which is a quarter, are Arab Israelis. So our youth movement is, is really flagship for being something that Jews and Arabs do together. And it's a very Zionist framework where Arabs find themselves in, into, integrated into and has been for more than 30 years. So Jewish and Arab programs, and it can be either through the youth movement or using soccer, using music, but we put lots of emphasis on trying to bridge the different communities through Jewish and Arab programs. Um, we have workshops that we do inside schools, uh, different seminars about different topics from democracy to social justice to gender and sex education. Um, we have national initiatives. Just one to say is we, we have been holding for more than 20 years um, rabbinic submissions and being part of the organizations who have been running the rabbin, rabbin rally in Tel Aviv for many years. And as I said, Aysan um, is, is the intentional communities, which are communities of urban communities, people that live together um, and work in the area, in the environment. And this part is also significant to understand how we jumped into action and dealt with COVID because we foster relationships on the very local level. Just taking myself as an example, I live in Petah Tikva one of the largest cities in Israel, more than 250,000 residents in Petah Tikva. And we have been living here as a community for more than a decade, fostering relationships with schools, with the youth department, with the municipality. They know of us and we know of them. And together we try to, on the day-to-day -day life, meet the, the different needs of the population. And that's something that gave us the ability to act quickly when COVID started, because on one hand, the wall is a it's a national organization, it's a well-known organization that, that people know and is also heavily supported by the Israeli government. As I said, we have schools, we have workshops, we have one of the largest youth movements in Israel, but also in the, on the other hand, Zor is very locally based. So we have both of those parts going for us, being national and local, both in the same time. Um, I will start and I also will, uh, will end uh, where COVID is at in Israel, but I will just, we are going back to a few months ago. Um, so the end of February, the 27th of February, this is when the first cases of COVID-19 started in Israel. And as Mark also said in the beginning of his, of his things, I think Israel was very prepared. Some people said that even it was quite harsh. Uh, when the idea of people coming from abroad going into 14 day of quarantine, just the end of February, that seems quite difficult to comprehend. Uh, and for us specifically, it, uh, it took us by surprise because at, uh, at the beginning of March at Purim, we have a big delegation to Poland for a week through our youth movement. We're talking more than 600 kids uh, going to Poland to study the Holocaust and to go to see the different camps. Uh, this is the biggest Israeli delegation that we're heading every year. And for us, the end of February was a, a, a message from the Ministry of Education saying, you have to cancel your trip, you cannot take your students. So for us, and so for me, that was a point where we said, okay, there's something really big going on here that we don't fully comprehend, that we need to cancel one of our biggest uh, programs of the year uh, just a few days before. Um, so just fast forward in the beginning of March after Purim, that's where everything kind of stopped here in Israel. Um, school stops, um, regulations on movement stopped, and um, around the 16th of, of March, that's really when everything kind of stopped. And uh, at, at that moment, I asked myself and many of my friends asked with me, 
Um, what, what do we do? What, what do we do with our students in our high schools? What do we do with our students in youth movements? What do we do with the communities that we live in? Um, what, how, what kind of support do people need? How can we aid people? Because at the beginning there was a big amount of uncertainty. How can you act? Can you leave your house? Can you, can you meet people? Uh, so I think that was a, a few ways of intense questions for us knowing that we want to be crucial, that we want to be responsible, that we want to do things, and to use, as I said, the advantages of being a national organization and a local organization both in the same time and to act quickly. Some of the programs, um, some of the programs that we ran started just a few days after, in the middle of March, and some of them took a little bit longer to start because we needed to, again, learn uh, reality, learn the rules, learn what we can do. Um, and in this, in this um, picture, you can see five of the major programs that we run through the months of March, April, until kind of the middle, end of May. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on two of them, which uh, I'm more personally connected, but I'm just going to go over this quickly so you just have a notion of what we did. Um, so on beginning on, on the left, and I'm going to expand about it, is we opened childcare programs for hospital workers that ran for seven to eight weeks. Um, we supported our communities uh, most vulnerable, mainly the senior citizens um, in 16 different localities. We had students in one of our high schools up, up north, which is a vocational school, manufactured protective equipment for hospitals and nursing homes. Um, they have laboratories in their schools. They are very kind of a um, cutting edge school. Uh, and they, in the middle of, of COVID, uh, got special permission to operate their schools. They had a bunch of students coming back in and they ended up, ended up manufacturing more than 30,000 protective equipment to, again, health workers, nursing home all over the country, all of it was done, all of this was done voluntarily, completely. Um, we did agricultural work because um, when COVID started, um, there was no um, foreign workers either from the East places like Thailand or, or people from the West Bank that were approved to come into Israel and to work the field. And there were crops that needed to be taken care of. So we volunteered all across the country in more than the 30 farms to help pick oranges, yams, strawberries, and even apples, you name it. Uh, and lastly, um, we, and that, that is something that we did quite quickly, um, we met all of our students. And again, I'm talking 60, 70,000 students in the youth movement and more than 1,100 students in our schools on a daily basis, virtually using Zoom, as we're using right now, or using YouTube to try to be available to the kids and to, to help them in their time of need and their time of lockdown to try to make their, their stay at home more, more fun, more educational. Um, and again, those are things that we did over a period of more than two months. And I want to focus now on two, two of the major things. Um, so one, and I, will, and I will also start with a story. Um, senior citizens um, and still are to this day in Israel, population that is mostly locked in their, locked in their houses and are not able to go out. Um, and they needed help uh, from food being delivered, medicine being delivered, supplies, and just a phone call of someone who can talk with them and just see how, how they are. Um, and, and as I said, because we have that connection with, um, because we have that connections with the different municipalities, we are able to get lots of names and phone numbers, thousands of, thousands of them, uh, and aid them on a weekly basis. And I will just share a small story that happened to me at the beginning of the lockdown. Um, I got a phone number by the, by the social services, the welfare system is here in Petah Tikva, my hometown. And I called a lady in the, in, um, I think she was at the end of her 70s. 
Uh, she is uh, an immigrant from a uh, former Serbian Union. Uh, her Hebrew was uh, not that good. And quickly, a few, a few minutes into the phone call, I realized that uh, that she has no, she needed medicine. She had a very severe case of diabetes and she needed to take medicine on a, on a daily basis. She was running out of the medicine and she could not leave her house because of the regulations. Um, and I tried for more than an hour to see if I could help her to log in into some of the online features that, that the hospitals and the, and the and the different claims have of sending medicine to people's home. And after, uh, and after a few minutes, I, I understood that she, she doesn't have any of those capabilities. She's living all by herself in, in, the, in her home. She, she knows not so much Hebrew. Um, and, um, and at the end, what I did is I sent a friend who lived just across, a uh, building across from her, to take her credit card and her prescription and go and buy for her medicine and give it to her. And, and I asked her over, over the phone and I asked her, listen, would you be comfortable in taking your credit card and your prescription and just taking them out under the door for someone that I know can come and take it for you, buy your things and, and take it back to your home? And she said, yeah, that, that's fine. And I said, are, are you sure? Like, if, if you're not feeling comfortable, I, we can try another thing. And she said, listen, I don't know you, but you sound nice, and you sound that you want to help me. And, and, and to be honest with you, I don't have not many other options. So if you're offering that help, I will take it. Uh, and, you know, it... I, 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 don't, I don't work so much with, with, uh, with senior citizens. Most of my work is with teenagers. And for me, that was a moment, again, to, to understand the, the amount, uh, the, the great need of people, and the fact that this kind of small gestures and, small, and, and solidarity, how meaningful it is in a time like this, that someone who is basically your neighbor, and you didn't know prior, just she lived two blocks from me, and I got her number from the social, from the social welfare in, in my hometown. And the fact that, that there is someone, and on that specific moment, it was me. On other moments, it was my friends or some of my students. But for someone to be that, that connection, someone who could get that need, find it quickly, and, and, and have the way to, to help. Uh, and and that, that small story that I told you, that is something that I, that I was uh, involved in for more than just two hours, that's it. Um, we had thousands of these cases, and um, and um, and it was tremendous the, the amount of help that we could uh, that we could give. Um, so I, I want to move next to something which I'm going to talk a bit more, um, it, which is the um, the frameworks that we did um, for the hospital workers. What what you can say is the the front line people that working in the front lines of this pandemic. So um, the pandemic began and obviously the working hours in hospitals were crazy. People were working around the clock and the corona, special corona departments were being open in most of the hospitals in Israel. Um, and these hospitals needed someone to help their kids because in that time, no schools keep all of the kids from the ages of three were at the homes. There was no program. So they, they needed something to be done. Uh, hospitals are very good in treating people. They are very good in doing what they were trained to do. But uh, education, hospitals, they don't go together. They don't know how to do that. They not, don't know how to quickly form a framework that, to, that could get, take care of, of the kids, of the workers of the nurses, of the doctors, of the, of the, of the HR people, of the, of the cleaning lady, of all of the people. And we're talking about thousands of people that work in each one of those huge hospitals in Israel. Um, and, and that's where we came uh, into action. Uh, we just began calling hospitals and saying, listen, we know that, you're, that, you, are, that, you, need, that you want to open up a framework for kids. That you want that you want someone to take care of the of the kids of some of the workers, uh, and give them a framework for a few a few days a week for some hours to have those people in to to do what they need to do now and is to take care of the pandemic, 
and to take care of people and to uh, and to take care of, of the sick in, in any way possible. Um, and we have, been, we have been able to collaborate with more than 10 hospitals uh, and give um, childcare for more than a thousand kids. Um, and we did that for seven to eight weeks. So just all of a sudden in the, in the middle of the school year, in the middle of our year, we, we just begin opening together with the hospitals and the local municipalities, those frameworks, um, which this picture that I'm showing you is just one out of many. Um, and I will just spotlight on uh, my own to, to give you some more color of, of how, how it looks like. Uh, so as I said, I live in Petah Tikva. Petah Tikva is um, uh, one of the biggest cities in, in Israel, more than 250,000 residents. Uh, and in Petah Tikva sits one of the most advanced um, cutting edge hospital medical center in Israel, which is called Rabin Medical Center. Uh, it's a huge, huge campus um, with more than 7,000 workers. So it's a very, very big uh, facility. Uh, and they were fortunate, fortunate enough to be assisted by the municipality on the first day of COVID-19. And they opened with the municipality and the army and us two frameworks, um, one preschool for kids ages three to six, and one elementary school um, ages eight to 12. Um, so they had more than 300 kids in two different frameworks. So again, this is, as I said, the hospital, that's not what they do, They're, that's not their expertise, but that's something they needed to be done. Uh, when, when we talked with them afterwards, they said, we had all of those plans written out when something like this will happen, but we didn't know how to do it. And all of a sudden, we had to take those plans out, put them on the table, and say, OK, in two days' time, we need a ferment like this running. So we started calling everyone that we can and said, we need this done by Sunday. So they needed to find a school. They needed to find janitors. They needed to find teachers. They needed to find someone who's going to run this, a principal. So all of those positions, that, was, that is something a hospital needs to be done, to be done very quickly. Um, so again, this is where me and my friends were the privilege of jumping in. Uh, we quickly recruited a, a team uh, of gap year um, uh, counselors and, and a few people after the army, all of them living in Petah Tikva in the area, to help, help with those kids. Um, we, of course, took, up, took up upon ourselves our kind of more natural role, which is being teachers, being counselors, being, working with youth. Uh, giving, gi giving them their expertise that we have of running uh, summer camps, of running informal activities, of giving the kids some uh, place which is safe, but also fun. Um, and running this for a few weeks, it is very uh, fulfilling, but also very exhausting. Uh, you can imagine five days a week from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. having those kids on one hand and also needing to be to be uh, fit with all the rules that are all, all, all of a sudden changing, um, and and having to be with masks and social distancing, which is not simple with the kids. Um, and you can also ask yourself, how could you have done that? How could you have taken people outside, meet met in person during the height of COVID? Um, like that, that seems not right, maybe irresponsible. And those are all good questions that we had along the way of um, how can we run this framework and be responsible for ourselves, be responsible for the health of the kids, and in, in, in bigger scale circles, be responsible for their families and all of their communities' well being. Uh, and I think that we've put the health issues in front. We, we've, we've been around the clock in trying to figure out how could we do it in the safest way possible. And I can tell you, looking retrospective to it nowadays to the back, that we had more than 200 counselors and, one, and more than 1,000 kids, and we didn't have even one positive um, infection of COVID-19 in all of our frameworks. So just that is a huge, huge accomplishment that we have able to to run those frameworks uh, and able to have all of our staff um, come out of it safe 
and and again building the trust with your parents was a difficult task um, and, I, and I want to um, to share a specific story uh, that happened to me in this uh, in this framework so after we've been been running it for a few weeks uh, the government said it was uh, it was a Thursday the government said that on this, on Sunday um, kindergartens and elementary schools are uh, it was the beginning of May, um, the, the curve was flattened, the numbers were going down, people felt that they can leave their houses more in Israel, which later out tend to be not so, so bright, but that's for a later stage of the presentation. Um, and everyone said on Sunday, we're, we're, we're terminating this framework, and on Sunday the kids are going back to the schools. We started, we started closing the program, we went to the, we closed all the classrooms, we boxed all of the games, and, and during all of the boxing, I called Rotem, which is, um, Rotem is, is the head of HR in Rabin Medical Center. Again, she's, the run, the, uh, she's running the HR for a campus of more than 7,000 workers, uh, and she has been the person who has been responsible for running these programs in behalf of the hospital. And I'm calling her and I'm saying, Rotem, I know that on the news people are saying that on Sunday everything is going back to normal, but I just wanted to let you know that if by any chance things will not go as well, um, give me a call and we'll be here for you. Um, just, just for your notice. And she said, no problem, I know, and you've done already, already enough and I cannot thank you enough and so on. Um, we finished Thursday, we said goodbye to the kids. We closed, we closed the child care program. Everyone went home safe. Um, and on Friday at 5 p.m., while I was making a Shabbat dinner, I practically making the challah, I got a phone call back from Rodney and she said to me, listen, we just got, we just got the news. Um, elementary schools are coming back on Sunday, but kindergartners are not. So we need to quickly open a framework for just one week for about 100, 120 kids from the ages of three to six. And she said, and she's, and she's telling me, you are my second phone call. The first phone call was to the mayor. Uh, and for this one that I'm talking to, I don't have anyone. I don't have anyone who's gonna be there on Sunday morning. I have a school, I have a janitor, but I don't have a, 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 even one counselor. And, and I, I need your help. Like, uh, I'm, I, need, I need like 20 of you. Can, can you do that? And I'm like, listen. <laughs> Give me 24 hours and I will try to do my best and I don't know, it's, uh, but, but I'll try. So you can imagine that weekend being on the phone all the time, uh, calling everyone I know uh, and saying, listen, we, we, we were called again and we need to open this for another week um, to help them get, get past this week and to, to, get, uh, to get back to normal. And on, and on Shabbat afternoon, it was about 6 or 7 p.m., I was able to have 10 people, staff, for Sunday morning. And I called Rotem, and I said, we'll be there at 6 30 a.m., we'll do them, 10 of us, and we'll help you get through the first, the first few days until you, you can get settled. And I think that that last week, uh, for me, and also with my, with my relationship with Rotem, uh, again, really, um, really gave me the, the feeling of uh, that we could be important, that, can, that we could be vital, we, that we could be contributing to an hospital, which I, it's something that I never did. I never worked in a hospital. I never, I never did anything. I, I never even imagined that my uh, upbringing as someone from a youth movement to professional life in formal education could be of any assistance to one of Israel's major hospitals. But here I am on Shabbat evening calling Rotem who is in charge of HR in the hospital and saying to her, tomorrow morning I will be there with 10 more people and we'll help you get through this day. Uh, and so we did and, uh, and we are able to assist and, and do that that week. And, uh, and uh, this is a, a picture uh, from from a few weeks ago when we had a, a, a really moving uh, ceremony in the hospital 
with the board of directors and, and also we received a thank you diploma for our assistance during uh, during that time uh, and again i think being able to do that um, and, and to assist and to be with those kids was, was um, again, was, I think, an experience that I won't forget um, and, and an experience that really, again, put, put a spotlight for myself on, on, uh, on our role in, in Israeli society and, and how can we, uh, can we impact. <clears throat> um, so, as I said, the, the impact has been, has been uh, very, very tremendous um, in all of those programs that, that I talked about. Uh, and again, if I'm going to kind of the reason why I think we were, we were able to jump into action so quickly is the fact that we nurture those grassroots level relationships in the different localities that where we live in. As I said, Dror is comprised of 16 intentional communities all over the country. We have been living there for 10, 15 years, and we have relationships from teacher level to principals to, to the different uh, sections in the municipality. And through those relationships on the ground with actual people and their actual need, we could have, we, we could have so quickly jumped into action and I created again together, it's not something that we did solely, the, uh, our senior, the, all the work that we did with senior citizens, we did it hand in hand with the municipality. All the names and phone numbers they gave us, all the, all the food that we delivered to the doors of the people, it's something that they bought and we just helped deliver. But I think that the fact that the municipality knows that they have, uh, I don't know, this special task for, task for Sofian, people who are committed to the cause, who want to volunteer, who want to do, um, and who are not so strict and, and, can, and can act quickly. It's something that, uh, for that case, helped us for the better and also for the greater community. And, and we were able to assist uh, lots of people uh, in ways that we knew we could, and also in new ways, uh, the manufacturing the, the, the gear for hospital workers as I told you from one of our schools, it's something that we never did before. And the need, the need drove us into action as well. Um, I want to um, fast forward to uh, and talk a bit about uh, what, what is happening right now in Israel and what, ha what is happening right now in Israel. Um, so as also Mark said at the beginning, unfortunately, um, what was considered to be a very good reaction in March, April, May, uh, we're now seeing a very hard spike in COVID-19 in Israel, um, mainly due to uh, reopening everything very fast, uh, which is something that I, unfortunately is embedded in, in, in Israeli culture of the, the feeling of ear beseder, we can do things quickly and, and, and uh, sometimes you, you need to be more formal and, and more forward thinking. And I think that is something that we lack from, uh, from bottom to up. Uh, and uh, we're seeing now a very big spike in cases and Israel unfortunately is beginning to close down uh, from, um, from businesses, restaurants, the beaches, um, and you cannot congregate outside more than 20 people, and the list is very long and, and unfortunately renewing every day. Um, and when we were planning for this summer, um, we had two major programs that you can also see on your screen that we thought that we would do. Um, one is um, we have, a, a, like lots of uh, and Jewish American organization, we have a very big summer camp program that is going on through July and August. Um, kids going for a few weeks. Um, and of course, we, we, uh, we, we quite quickly understood that we won't be able to facilitate our long summer camps. So what we did is we said we will do it on the local level. We have many day camps in our youth movement branches for children. Uh, we will able to facilitate pink kids in capsules of up to 40 kids uh, and we will be able to give them and, 
urban experience, not so much going outdoors, but an urban experience of being safe with their counselors, being able to have fun, because at the end of the day, kids in Israel, and I'm sure that in Canada and Toronto it's the same, have been locked in their house for a few good months now, and for every kid, it's not a good experience. They need that filtering, that they need that time out. Um, so this is something that we did. And the second thing that you can see on the right uh, is a um, program for youth uh, where we operate sport facilities or just place uh, gardens and we bring counselors with different workshops that we do it can be based around music or sports or arts and crafts and we try to get the kids involved in the night times and keep them off the streets and uh, uh, keep them in, a, in an open but safe environment. So unfortunately, um, the new regulations came in and you can all, only do programming for kids until the ages of nine, nine to 10. So all of the programs that we had for youth and teenagers had to be canceled. Uh, and also the, the work for kids uh, has been lowered down very much. And uh, lots, of our, uh, lots of our programming needed to be done virtually at the end of the day. Um, so we are in a, again in a, in, a, in a great stage of uncertainty of, we had lots of plans for this summer. Some of them we have been able to execute and some of them were in the midst of trying to do it now. But as reality caught up with us, again, new restrictions. And, and again, we need to find new ways of how we, we will be able to serve our students, our communities, um, and trying to again navigate through the regulations of uh, what is going on. And uh, I will finish with this picture, um, which is uh, of a demonstration that has begun um, two weeks ago with the coalition of all the youth movements in Israel, because what happened basically is the new restrictions that I told you about. So all the youth movements in Israel has uh, has been forced to shut down the branches and, and not been able to serve all of their students. Um, so we are kind of forced to begin on a, on a public um, uh, public combat against Ministry of Education to say um, we know how to run those frameworks. The, the example of what I told you of the hospitals just a few minutes earlier. Um, we have kids, teenagers, who want to do something, want to contribute, want to be meaningful, uh, like, the, like the girl uh, holding the sign saying, I also want to be a young counselor. Uh, that is taken from a protest with a uh, protest in lots of major junctions all over the country with, with our counselors just saying that, uh, the shouting out that they want their, their youth movement open, they want to care for kids, let them be responsible. Um, and, and I'm saying that not, not to provoke some kind of anti booby uh, measure, but, but by, by saying that I think that an organization like DRO, um, which is um, with our experience and our knowledge of the, of, of the things and, and with all of our students, we have the ability to navigate between the regulations and to keep people safe. Uh, and this is a fight that we're in the midst of, um, and we are. And I can say that we're fortunate to be backed up by lots of mayors, by some politicians, by some major Israeli uh, figures who are backing us. Some of them are alumni of youth movements themselves, who are saying, "Let youth movements uh, reopen this summer. Let them do what they do best, uh, and and let them take care of our kids, so we can." Be open, so we can be free to um, get back to our jobs, to to get back to, uh, to 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 find a new job. I don't know because when parents are not um, free in their minds to uh, to pursue their, their 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 career because they need to take care of two or three, four young children, young children at home. Uh, so nothing good will come out of it. And, and we're saying that we could be that organization who can take care of lots of kids uh, safely. Um, I want just to finish uh, by saying 
First of all, thank you for all of you for um, taking the time and listening to me, some of you for the second time. Um, and I know that all of us are living through a kind of mutual experience these days with COVID, uh, both in Israel and in Canada and all over, and basically all over the world. And, um, and we're basically dealing with the same things of, of social distancing, of being lots, a long time in our homes for being worried about how we make a living and, and, and what will happen to society. And I think that the story of, of Dror is at the end of the day, a story of hope, of how ordinary people um, they showed up and took very small responsibilities from delivering a medicine to um, uh, looking over some kids to calling someone or picking some strawberries, all very small actions. But I think in a time of crisis, in a time of big need, like, like the time that we're facing now, I think that all of those small things um, mount up to a very uh, big thing. Um, and, and this is kind of what, what, our society, what all of our societies, I think, mutually need that sense of a, a partnership, that sense of togetherness, that, that sense of responsibility, and that I'm not alone, that I have someone that I can trust. Uh, and I think that is what we're, at the end of the day, that is what we're trying to do. And that, that is my message of this presentation, is that I think that um, we, we showed up, we showed up like we showed up on regularly, like we, we have been doing for the past 15, 20 years, but we showed up in a time I think where the need was was more shouting to the roof, uh, and we we've been fortunate to assist all of those people. And again, in those days, as as I as I told you about trying to again think about what what we're going to do because entering that second wave, uh, which looks now to be much worse than what you, that one we already experienced. Um, I think much more of those actions will needed to be come to to help Israel uh, maintain the crisis that it's going through. So um, here I will finish. Thank you, you, and uh, we can look at some questions. Um, Rui, um, thank you, thank you very much for this um, very informative and inspiring uh, presentation. I, I think it really does um, demonstrate.